Our final presenter today is Timothy Gabriel Cremines, who is very well known here on campus. Mr. Cremines is an accomplished composer who specializes in traditional Byzantine melodies for liturgical texts in English. His work is available for liturgical use on his website, EnglishMineon.com. He has written musical scores for the liturgical services of the Orthodox Church, including the feast days of Christ, the Theotokos, and the saints of the Mineon, Vespers, and the Divine Liturgy, as well as of saints canonized in more recent years, or saints unknown to the Greek Minea, for example, St. John of Kronstadt. Mr. Cremin trained in the art of composition with Papa Ephraim, Hieromon, and Protopsaltis of, uh, at St. Anthony's Monastery in Florence, Arizona. Uh, he also studied here at Holy Cross for a number of years, uh, as well as with uh, Mr. John Michael Boyer, Protopsaltis of the Metropolis of San Francisco, and member of the Capella Romana Vocal Ensemble. Uh, he is a recent graduate of Hellenic College, uh, where he was and still is a member of the Holy Cross St. Romanos de Melodis Byzantine Choir, and among the first group of candidates to receive a certificate of Byzantine music from the school last May. The title of Mr. Kremins' workshop is Composing Byzantine Music in English. Please welcome. <laughs> As you may have already gathered from the title and some of Manus's comments, this is a very specific focused topic that I'm going to be presenting today. But before we delve into all the intricacies and specificities of, of this question, not just for English, but for business music composition in a, a languages other than Greek in general, right at the beginning I want to take a very <coughs> broad approach and talk about the purpose of church music in general, not just Byzantine music specifically, because I think that will set a good foundation for what we're going to do here today. Regarding church music, St. Gregory the Theologian says, with melody, the musical poet attempts to explain the meaning of what is being said by intertwining the divine words with an unaffected melody as well as a certain intonation of the voice, in order to reveal as much as is possible the meaning hidden in the words. That is to say, the purpose of any ecclesiastical music is, or should be, the expression of the text being set to music. For the various Orthodox musical traditions, the essential question then becomes, how do we express the text of this hymn we are chanting, regardless of whether we're chanting Byzantine music, Russian music, Bulgarian, even American church music, if you think there is such a thing. So how do we do that? In Byzantine music, there are certain very specific tools that the composer has available to him to express the meaning of the hymn. The first of these tools is the what are known as the thesis, or in English as formulae, formulas. And according to the classic definition by Manu Chrysophis, a thesis is the combination of signs which comprises the melody, which we chant. In other words, a form formula, as it's called in English, formulas are melodic patterns which are expressed as a specific combination of symbols. The practical ramification of this fact is that these formulae can be classified in terms of textual accentuation. In other words, we can group thesis by by their accentuation patterns, whether the, the accent is three syllables from the end, four from the end, where it falls in the scope of the sentence we're talking about. The other ramification of this is that one cannot simply choose a melodic line for a piece of text because one likes the way it sounds. Rather, the thesis the composer chooses must clearly and accurately express the accentuation and the meaning of the text that the composer is setting to music. And, of course, Musically speaking, the transition, the formula should be able to transition well between the preceding and following parts of the melody in general. Another tool that the composer has available to him is what we refer to as text painting. In other words, the use of the music itself, not just as a melody, but as specific high notes, low notes, modulations, and so on and so forth, 
to express the literal meaning of what is being said. In other words, we can use the pitch to illustrate the meaning of the text we are chanting by using high notes on words such as heaven, resurrection, ascent, cry out, so on and so forth. Low notes on words such as Hades, death, descent, earth, and so on and so forth. Abrupt drops in the melodic line for words like fall, fallen, and so on and so forth. Text painting can also take the form of modulations to other modes, such as modulations to the chromatic genus with more sharps and flats, at least compared to the other modes. On words such as sickness, deception, fire, enemy, and so on and so forth. There are other examples, but these are the basics. Those are the tools that the composer of Byzantine music uses, at least in the original Greek. The question for English, or for any language for that matter, is how should we apply these particular tools of the composer to English? To English text or to any translated text? Should we follow the Greek melody very rigidly, only making the most absolutely necessary changes for the English? I would call this strict adherence to the, to the melody, the original. Or the reverse, should we simply apply the above mentioned principles of text painting, thesis, and so on and so forth to the translation, in this case English, with no reference to the Greek at all? Or should we take a middle ground and try to mimic the overall structure and rhetoric of the Greek, choosing melodic lines that better suit the English, but simultaneously attempting to remain faithful to the original? I would call this informed adaptation. So we're composing a musical score, but not out of the blue, so to speak. We're basing it on an original Greek text. So we have to choose an approach when we set a text in English to music. Theoretically, we could pick any one of these. But perhaps a better idea might be to step back and ask another question before we go into whatever we want. And that question should be, how did composers in other languages before us, other older masters of Byzantine music in other languages, how did they approach the same problem that we're trying to, we're trying to tackle today? On this slide, we have a brief study of random musical samples that were taken by Father Ephraim of St. Anthony's Monastery in Arizona. In Father Ephraim's study, he examined Slavonic and Romanian music samples taken at random from several music books that were composed by native speakers of the languages to see what their approach was to this particular problem. What Father Ephraim found was that in both cases, both in the Slavonic and the Romanian mus musical examples that he found, there's a tendency to mimic an original Greek setting, but the general outline of it, not necessarily the specific thesis, unless they fit the text of the hymn that, which they are trying to set. In other words, they don't undertake original composition without reference to the Greek. They make reference to a Greek setting or to some other well-known setting, but they in, also, at the same time, choose theses that work for their particular language, not attempting to hold on as tightly as they possibly can to the Greek melody, and thereby sound unnatural. And as Father Ephraim writes, in Slavonic, from the samples he took, there was only one instance he found where the formulaic rules were broken in order to preserve some kind of reminder of the Greek. And in Romanian, it didn't happen at all. Again, this is a random sampling, but it does prove a point. In another brief study that was undertaken by Dr. Ioannis Arvanitis of Athens, Dr. Arvanitis examined and transcribed into the new method an adaptation written by Petrus the Peloponnesian, to whom this year's festival is dedicated, <coughs> of a particular hymn taken from the Anasasmetarion of Panagiotis to the New Christophis. This is an extremely valuable study, if for no other reason than the almost unrivaled important importance of Petros the Peloponnesian as a composer, compared to, for instance, the composer in Slavonic and Romanian. As Arvanitis writes, Petros's work is an adaptation of the Anasasmetarium by Chrysophis the New into Slavonic, done, of course, in the right way, not merely by adapting the words faithfully to the original, but also using other formulas 
when necessary. However, Petrus does preserve the structure of the original. The overall cadence is the, what I would call the scope of the piece. Given the stature of Petrus as a composer, it is especially interesting to note that his musical score is an adaptation <coughs> using the same method as the composers we noted in Romanian and Slavonic. In other words, an adherence to the spirit of an original Greek setting, but not necessarily the, the letter. We adapt the formula where necessary to fit the different accentuation patterns of the particular hymn in the language we're working with. As we just saw very briefly, there seems to be a specific process and method which was followed by older composers, masters of the Psaltic art, up to and including figures such as Petros the Peloponnesian, who are quite frankly unparalleled. So for this reason, as Manuel Krisakis writes, we will imitate the older <coughs> composers, try to apply their method, this time to English, in the hopes that the mu music we compose will be an authentic continuation of the Psaltic art. So the method we're going to use in this presentation workshop will be a distillation of the process we observed in these Greek, Slavonic, in these Romanian, Slavonic, and so on scores. This is essentially how I approach the process. Again, trying to look at the work of composers and adapters who have come before. And I believe that this is a relatively, relatively accurate representation of the process that they used. So the first step is to compare the Greek and the English translation for similarities to see if there are places where we could possibly use the same thesis. The second is to examine the Greek musical score for the general melodic contour, how low, how low and how high it goes, and so on and so forth, if it's relatively simple, relatively complex. Step three is to examine the Greek score, the Greek musical score, that is, for distinctive features such as text painting, unusual thesis and modulations, and so on and so forth, whatever makes the hymn we're working with specific, what sets it apart from other pieces in that particular style. And then the final step, Compose an adaptation that both sounds natural in English and abides by the formulaic rules, simultaneously attempting to preserve both the overall scope and the distinct elements of the original. To help with step one, this is a handout that has the original Greek text and an English translation with the accentuation patterns of the text marked. On this sheet, a one indicates an accent and syllable, a zero indicates a non-accent and syllable. In Greek, you only see ones and zeros. In English, you also see an X, which means a syllable that can be either, either accented or not, depending on the preference of the speaker or the poet, so on and so forth. We don't have much of a choice in Greek. They're accented and non-accented syllables, but in English, there's a little more liberty sometimes. This is the hymn itself, which you have on your sheet, both the Greek and the English translation. This is a Voxesti Gon, a hymn chanted at Vespers to commemorate the martyrdom of Saints Evlambios and Evlambia, who are brother and sister who were martyred, martyred for their faith in Christ in the city of Nicomedia around the turn of the fourth century. The hymn itself, as you can see on the screen, reads, likeness of name joined with fraternal love and purity mingled with dispassion preserved intact the steadfastness of your purpose. For whenever God is that which is longed for, the whole world is disdained. O oh, wonder, the serpent is slain, and the infernal one who spake unrighteousness to the uttermost is spelled by wise Eulampius and Eulampia the sibling martyrs. With songs of comely praise, let us cry unto them, Ye that in Christ have finished your course well, ask that peace be granted unto the world, and great mercy to our souls. This is a scan of the original Greek score taken from the Musiki Kipseli series by Stefanos Talambadarios. And as you can see in this slide, some of the distinctive and or rather unique thesis modulations and so on and so forth of the original Greek score have been marked. 
we'll, we'll talk about each one of them in a little bit more detail later. But so that you can have it with you to refer to. This is another handout. It's a copy of the of this score, but without the highlight. So now we'll go through line by line the English translation that we have, comparing the Greek and the English to see what kind of musical composition or rather musical adaptation we can create, both by examining the Greek, looking for similarities in accentuation patterns or other places where we can preserve distinct melodic lines from the original, and also places where we might have to deviate from the original in order to render the text more naturally in English. So in Greek, as you, you can see on the screen, I have the accentuation patterns marked. The Greek and the English are not similar at all. In the opening line, we start on the note Ba, we ascend to the V, and then we return back to the note Vu for a medial cadence on the comma that you see in the Greek. Again, there's not much similarity between the two, so we have to choose different thesis in English that are suitable for the text we're working with, but achieve the same overall result. And that is what I've written here. So when we look at the Greek, it goes as follows. <laughs> of accentuation, we need to use different thesis. So in English we have likeness of name joined with fraternal love. Again, same overall melodic movement. We've ascended from Ba to D. We've returned to Vu for this medial cadence on the comma, but in a way that's suitable for English. In the next phrase, as you'll see, the accentuation patterns are actually the same in English and Greek, which allows us to quote the original Greek melody to preserve it. patterns are the same, we can quote the original in our English adaptation to preserve some of the characteristic thesis or melodic lines in order to remind ourselves of what the Greek text sounded like. In the next phrase, we descend from Vita Fa due to the Ano Thelia, which is rendered in, in English as a semicolon. The sentence hasn't totally come to an end, but the thought has come to a close. We've reached a break in the text, so we want a semi-final cadence on Ba to illustrate that. This is characteristic of the particular mode that we're looking at. <coughs> because the accentuation patterns differ, though, as you can see, there's not much similarity at the end of each one. We have to choose a different thesis in English that still suits our purposes. So in Greek, I'm going to lower it a little bit. It's a little higher. <laughs> Of them, but 
<coughs> the thesis that is circled, or rather this portion of it here, is such that it's one of several theses, or one of many rather, that can take a variable number of syllables. Certain theses only take set accentuation patterns. Some of them are a little more variable. This is one of the more variable ones. So whereas in, Eng in Greek it's used for a phrase that is accented three syllables from the end, as you can see the one zero zero, we can use the same thesis for only two syllables from the end by removing one of the one of the syllables, as you see in the English long for. We only have two syllables. So in Greek we have in English. For whenever God is that which is long for. So in the boxed area, the melodies are exactly the same. The next portion, the descent from Badalo B, is one of one of the more characteristic melodic lines in this piece. It's done for text painting purposes. On the word disdained, kataferonite, we descend from Badalovi. The English and the Greek are not similar, but we still want to preserve this instance of text painting as best as we possibly can. It's something that's specific and somewhat unique about the Greek setting. So we'll choose, again, a thesis that achieves the same effect. It descends from Badalovi, but it achieves the effect we want and is appropriate for the English text. So in Greek, Boys, my soul. Here, we have the same thesis we saw in the previous, or the same pattern of the notes that we saw in the previous melodic lines, and that is these right here, which in Greek takes three syllables, but in English, it's possible to be used only with two, allowing us to keep the overall melodic line and general feel of the original. So in Greek, and in English, essentially the same thing. The next phrase is arguably the most distinct about the entire piece. And it's somewhat problematic too because the Greek and the English patterns of accentuation differ significantly. This melodic phrase is very evocative because it, first of all, it descends to low ge, which is unusual to begin with, and this mode is very unusual. And it's done by quoting the plagal first mode. This is not a fourth mode cadence. This, this is plagal first. And it's done on, on the phrase, the serpent is slain. So we descend from V all the way down to low ke. We descend to seven. Because the patterns of accentuation are not the same, we use the same process we've been using so far. And that is to choose a thesis from the same genre, from the same style, that fits the English to accomplish our purposes without sounding <coughs> unusual in English by quoting the original directly. So this thesis I've chosen is characteristic of the playable first mode, and yet it fits the English accentuation pattern we're looking at. So in Greek, in English. Thy serpent is slain. Up until this point, we've been pretty lucky with the translation that we've been working with because essentially the English translation was line by line mashing up with the Greek, allowing us to preserve a lot of what was going on in the musical score. In this case, we have something of an issue because the musical score, which we'll look at in a moment, continues to present these very evocative and distinct melodic movements. 
ending on the word hypochthonios, the infernal one with a cadence on ni, which essentially never happens in this mode. It's a very unusual modulation. The problem is that, as you can see, the sentence order is switched. In Greek, we have kioisipsos, adikian, lalisas, hypochthonios. And in English, and the infernal one who spake unrighteousness to the uttermost. In Greek, to the uttermost is at the beginning. The infernal one is at the end. This is problematic musically, because in Greek, we start up high, as you can see on the left here. Choice ipsos, we send to, the, to a very high note for this particular melodic line, from V to V. We descend from V to V for who spake in righteousness, adikian valisas, and then for ipochthonios, the infernal one, we descend even farther to ni. But the English sentence order is not the same. Interestingly, though, the syllabification patterns are, so we could theoretically use most of the same thesis as I did in, in the English. <coughs> so in Greek, we have. Similar. 
We have another similar case here. We see our friend the Thessus we've seen several times now, this particular one. In Greek, taking two syllables. In English, we can use it to take three so as to preserve the original melody. And we've made a similar change later on in the line using a variation of the Thessus that takes four syllables instead of three. Again, so that we can preserve the original melody. The result, with the exception of only a few notes, is exactly the same as in the Greek. With songs of calm, we praise the joys from to them. Here, we have another case where the syllabification patterns are the same allowing us to quote the Greek. He called in Christ. It's the same, it's the same movement because the accentuation patterns are the same. The phrase after it is not similar in any way, shape, or form, unfortunately. But it goes between the notes V and V. It's a thesis in Agia, fourth mode. So I've chosen a different thesis to suit the English text, and that it achieves the same result, moving from V to V, but accentuating the syllables the way we want them. So in English, I finished your course well. In the next phrase, there's a little more similarity. Not enough that we can quote the original, but we can use a variation on the thesis that is very similar to the original Greek in order to preserve the same kind of melodic movement. So in Greek we have Rather, it uses a variation on this cadence that accentuates the word megra, or great, great mercy. In English, the patterns of the accents are similar enough that we can use the exact same melodic shape, but the text painting result is a little lost. So in Greek, we have. <laughs>
However, as we've seen, it utilizes the method of previous composers and adapters of Byzantine chant into other languages, up to and including Petros the Peloponnesian, his particular method or approach to this problem of adaptation. And so we hope that this score and scores like it are a faithful continuation of the Psaltic art, but in English. So let's. No. Greek rhetoric, even the modern Greek 
um, you know, only have stress and unstressed accent, the, the rhetorical and, and accentuation rules are still based on a system of long and short vowels. Um, it, moving forward from here, is it useful to further analyze the theses in terms of in terms of long and short vowels and how these wind up being used, how, how Greek composers wind up using them, and how it might be applicable for our purposes. What I used in this presentation was, is the approach of Father Ephraim mm -hmm. in Arizona, essentially, mm -hmm. to the, the question of how to apply the thesis and so on and so forth. And it's true that they can be thought of in terms of stressed and unstressed syllables. Mm -hmm. None of the theses are actually that, that simple. Because you can have X number of theses that have a specific accentuation pattern 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. <coughs> but they don't all work to the same degree for the concepts you're trying to express, regardless of whether the, the syllables are short or long and so forth. So in Greek, for instance, you might have a phrase that has, yes, a certain pattern of accented syllables but there's still a certain concept within that pattern of accents mm -hmm. that is more important and kind of overrides the, the accentuation pattern to a certain degree. We can, we can classify the thesis in terms of their, their accentuation patterns, but in terms of which thesis we use, we have to look at both the meaning and the accentuation pattern. So I understand what you're saying about the, the long and the short syllables, but even, even the accentuation of the, thes of the, of the syllabification patterns and so on and so forth is not so much the real question when it comes to the thesis. It's what concept you can use the thesis to express. And as a secondary way of looking at it, you can consider the textual accentuation. I used it here because it's, it's extremely useful for the purposes of comparing the English and the Greek and seeing, OK, they're similar in this case. Maybe we can use the same, same thesis with the caveat that the same thesis is applicable if it accentuates, if it brings out both the idea of the English, not necessarily even the, the accentuation pattern. So I think it's a good point about, about the long and the, the short syllables and so on and so forth. But I think an even more important concept to think about is what the thesis is doing with the pattern of accents that you apply to it. Since there's more than one option, there's not, it, it would be a different story if there was only one option for a zero, zero, 001 accentuation pattern or something like that. Thank you. Once again, thank you to Gabriel. Thank you.